Amen. All right, Hebrews 9. We're going to read verse 11 through 15, beginning at verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, Of the blood of bulls and of goats, the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it for the purifying of the flesh. Together. And for this cause, he's the mediator of the new covenant. Tell me, I'm sorry. For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We ask your blessing upon the word of God. Open it up that we might grasp what you want us to understand today. Thank you for the body of Christ. Add your blessings to your word in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise God. The writer here in Hebrews has set out to share with the readers a better covenant. Established upon better promises than the old system of law, old Levitical system, which dealt with sacrifices, animal sacrifices, and its purpose pointed to the reality of the true tabernacle and the old covenant was. And the tabernacle and everything within it were only types and shadows. But thank God Christ came. He is the reality of all that they were saying in the old, under the old covenant. Verse 11 says, well, let me go back to verse 1. Let me go back again a chapter over. The writer of Hebrews, the first seven chapters, he stated how Christ is superior to the angels, uh, Moses, and uh, everything that the writers of Hebrew under now, they were, that, that well then they were experiencing, it was better, far better than the old covenant so but still some of them were contemplating turning back they missed the sacrifices they missed their friends they were suffering and so they basically had been thinking in terms of going back so the writer writes to this problem and shares with them that the old system was only types and shadows of what they have in Christ. And so chapter 4 deals with rest and chapter 5 talks, touches on the high priest Christ and touches on Melchizedek and uh, he interjects the lack of maturity in the bottom of chapter 5, and then he moves on in and says, therefore, let's go on to maturity. And he talks about the oath that God made to Abraham, and then he picks up again in chapter 7, uh, Melchizedek. And he began to share, and then he, of course, related to the priesthood. And then chapter 8, he says... 
Now, the things that I've been saying to you or the things that I've been saying in the previous chapter, this is the sum of what I'm saying. He says, uh, verse 1, um, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And so he takes up again this high priestly uh, statements that he made. And he goes on and moves into chapter 9. And he began to talk about the first covenant. And then he's going to talk about the new covenant. He begins by talking about the old tabernacle. How the, tab well, the tabernacle, how it was, two parts. He explained the vessels and he explained the purposes of the first room and then the second room, which was behind the veil. And brings us up to verse 11. After he said that those things really could not uh, really accomplish, they were not able to make the comers there to perfect and pay attention to this as pertaining to conscience. Someone say conscience. We all have a conscience. Someone says the conscience is a built-in court of law. God put a court system in our being. And that court system lets us know what's right and what's wrong. And as long as we don't outrun it and consistently deny the effectiveness of it so that it becomes seared or no longer sensitive. So he moves in verse 11. He said, but Christ being coming high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once to the holy place. Notice this statement. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. For cause if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh or the body, the exterior. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge? your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this cause, he's the mediator of the new covenant, the New Testament, that my means of death for the redemption of the sins or transgressions that were under the first covenant or testament, they which are called might receive the promise of Eternal inheritance. It is true that we should visit scriptures like this, like these, often to make certain that our consciences are clear. because we are constantly bombarded with thoughts from the evil one that would love to keep us in some form of bondage or fear. So when we visit the truths of the word of God, they, they help to liberate us, bring our minds into peace. 
So he makes some powerful statements here. He talks about the old tabernacle, which was earthly. And he talks about the new tabernacle, which was in heaven. There's such a distinction from heaven and earth. Earth is down here as we know it. We see matter. We see things with our eyes. But heaven is up there. And we do not see those things, but they are there nonetheless. Jesus came from heaven. And he began to talk about things in that environment. And men could not relate to it. But it didn't mean that it was not true. Am I right? That's where he came from. Um, so as he talked about the superior tabernacle, that which was not made by hands, and it is true that the old was types and shadows, as we said earlier. When we focus on or visit the old tabernacle and the system and the laws of or the laws that govern this tabernacle they're based on fear and so they were not designed to heal us they were not designed for perfection they were not designed to change us they were designed to amplify or magnify sin, to show that sin was very sinful because they could not keep it. Has anybody ever felt that way, that you cannot keep God's word? If you feel that way, you may be, as I've been for years, you may be trying to keep the law as it's stated in the Old Testament where there were no divine provisions for perfection. But I'm going to read this portion again. He says, verse 11 Chapter 9, but Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having accomplished, having obtained what? eternal redemption for us. Notice 12 and 13, it talks about the power of the old sacrifices under the old system. The power of these sacrifices of animals and pigeons or turtle dove for the poor. The blood or the life it was in the blood that was offered for sin was able to purify or cleanse the exterior. They were able to cleanse the body for the use of ceremony. You still with me? But they had no power to cleanse the inner parts of a human. They were totally ineffective. Are you still with me? But yet they were effective enough to cleanse the outer. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ, his sacrifice of his life was one that was perfect. And the old sacrifices had to be perfect also. But they had to be perfect on the outside. 
They couldn't be broken. They couldn't have a broken leg or, you know, couldn't have three out of four legs or whatever. Couldn't be blemished, sickly. But, so they were offered and they were perfect in that sense. But Christ was not only perfect on the outside, but he was perfect on the inside. Are you with me? He was the son of God. Had no sin. The difference also in the uh, desire or the will of these sacrifices varied was different also. No animal volunteered to die. <laughs> no animal came running saying, kill me, you know, I want to die. But against their own selves, they had to die. There is a difference. Christ says, Father, prepare me a body. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. He willingly offered up his body, his life's blood. He was pure, right? Since he was pure and he willingly offered up his life, he, the sacrifice that he offered, had to offer, was fully sufficient to purify, somebody say purify, our conscience from all guilt. Are you with me? The sacrifices that were made under the old covenant, the nature of them, the sacrifices, they would remind them of their sins continually. Anybody hear what I'm saying? Anybody living under the old covenant? But the sacrifice of Christ reminds us through Holy Communion of forgiveness and redemption. That's what it's designed to do. So we are to, when we reflect on the sacrifice of Christ, it should provoke gratitude. Somebody say, Gratitude. When you think back on the sacrifices, the song says, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cry out hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now let me pause and talk a little about this guilt uh, that's produced uh, by or provoked by repeated consciousness of sin, right? When I'm, con when I'm sin conscious, I will always have guilt. Did I lose anybody? Let me say that again. When I'm sin conscious, I'm going to have continual guilt. That's the nature. That's how the Old Testament works. But when I am righteous conscious, there is forgiveness. There is gratitude. So God wants us to be thankful, to be grateful, to know that we've been forgiven. 
So we must not think in terms of the sin consciousness. It must be the fact that what he did for us, he obtained eternal redemption for us. There was only one offering required. That which made them sin conscious was the high priest going into the Holy of Holies every, once, every year, once a year, every year with the blood for the sins of himself and then for the congregation or the people of Israel. So it just kept them conscious of their sins all the time. That's how they live. So since they lived with consciousness of sin, they were always under guilt. And since they were always under guilt, they were always fearful. Anybody? Now let's talk about this guilt, because I was talking about that, asking the Lord about guilt, because that's what he kind of began to point out. The conscience. Somebody say conscience. Uh, guilt, now, is the fact of having committed a specified crime or offense. It's, 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 you know, having that thought or the fact of having, I've done something wrong. I haven't measured up. I'm not pleasing God. That thought life constantly keeps us in a state. What he pointed out to me is that it breeds fear of punishment. So if it breeds fear of punishment, my expectations cannot be as it would be if I believe that I'm okay. Uh, my expectation subtly is expecting something to go wrong. It can't be this good. Life can't be this good. Something has got to go wrong somehow. My expectation when there's guilt underneath the surface. Then uh, uh, also it produces a lack of confidence. I cannot meet, reach my potential living a life of guilt. He said it's a lack of confidence when guilt is there. Then he said conscience, which is an inner feeling or voice viewed as acting as a guide to the righteous, to the right, the rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. It's a sense of right and wrong, conscience, right? So if my conscience, if I feel guilty, my conscience needs to be purified, right? And if it's not purified, then there's going to be fear and there's going to be lack of confidence and uh, there's, not, there's going to be no inner peace. I can look like I have peace on the outside, but inside I do not have peace, right? Because of my conscience. I said the conscience is a built-in court system, right? So if you go to the court house and the judge, you're waiting for the judge to pronounce some sentence. You know, you don't. I don't know about you, but in, in the natural, I don't necessarily feel like I belong in the courthouse. And so as a sinner, he doesn't feel like he belongs in church, right? <laughs> but I feel right at home in church. Why? Because I'm righteous, right? But the court system within is like governing our conscience. If we, that sense of right and wrong. And so if there's guilt, then there's always that that's making me feel very subtly that I'm not measuring up to God, right? And where that subtle feeling like I'm just not measuring up to God, remember now that my confidence cannot be as it would be if I have peace underneath the surface, right? So if there's a, a lack of confidence, if there's 
guilt, then my conscience will certainly not be uh, peaceful. I will have those subtle things. You know how you do when you get at night, you sleepy, 10.30, 11, 11.30 at night, you're ready, should be in, go and close your eyes and go to sleep. But you pick up the Bible and read just a little bit just to fall asleep, just to get rid of that little guilt feeling. Y'all know what I'm saying? You know God ain't in that. You know what I'm saying? God is not that way. He's not that way. If you missed it for the day, try it again tomorrow. Isn't that right? <laughs> Don't take yourself through that. You know, I remember one preacher sharing that. And uh, he was saying, it was T.L. Osborne, to be quite honest with uh, TBN. And he said something to the fact of people, sometimes how we do ourselves, but when we have guilty conscience. And he says, if you're at that point in your Christian walk, he said, I'd start over. In other words, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Well, where does the guilt come from? I have one, one Christian uh, um, uh, counselor said he had a stack of papers, or I guess application, where there are those that would have appointments. It was probably that high, and they were all Christians. And he said, Christians are some of the most guilty people on the face of the earth. What that says is that we all need to visit the truth, right? We have to visit the truth because whom the Son sets free, he's free indeed. So with, the guilt, with guilt, there is no, again, there is fear of punishment. Lack of confidence, our expectation has fear. And when things go wrong, it's like, yeah, I knew it. No inner peace. And it keeps us in, these are things the Lord spoke to me, and it keeps us in a performance mode. I got to keep performing so I can feel good. About me. You know what I'm saying? What I'm talking about? But the Lord doesn't want us. He wants us free from this. He wants us free from this. That's not what salvation is all about. Salvation is faith. In the life blood of a perfect sacrifice. That purifies our conscience. We are saved by faith in the shed blood of Christ. That's how we come into him. We can't get there no other way, right? And we, we just say, yes, I believe when we hear the gospel. And so it brings us out of darkness into light. And after we're in the light, now the just shall live by. And he says, from faith to faith, right? But we do get caught up in Trying to be good. I mean, that just, it just happens. The only problem with that is our happiness is normally measured by how good we do continually. What do you mean by that? When I do good, I feel good about myself. I got joy. I got happiness, right? But when I don't do good because of the guilt, right? I can't be happy because I'm basing it on performance or works. As long as I base my salvation on works, I can only be happy when I'm performing well. Now y'all know I'm telling the truth. So in order to be free from that, what do we do? We receive 
what Christ has already done. Now, I'm going to read this again. Follow with me, if you will. Verse 11, chapter 9. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, the body, the outward, the exterior, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purify, purge, cleanse our conscience from dead work. That inner court system purifies, says you are not guilty any longer. We are not guilty, no matter how we feel. We are not guilty anymore. So, we can receive the purifying of our conscience because of the sacrifice that's been made. Yes. Amen. So, I'll read a further here. Through one offering, he says, there is sanctified or perfected or permanently cleansed or made acceptable to God through one offering, through one sacrifice. He has cleansed or sanctified forever. Somebody say forever. forever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You say, well, I mean, I don't know. The Bible says if we sin, we have an advocate. That is so true. That means if you sin, you don't want to stay there, right? But he's made, but as far as the, the sacrifice, the ransom price that the Father ordained, before we could be freed up was a one-time deal. He offered his blood. For as in Adam all died. Are you with me? Adam sinned and I died. I didn't sin of my own, but I sinned because Adam was the originator or the father of the human race, right? So he died, so all of the children died. But in the same way, glory to God, Christ being the head of the new community, as in Christ, Adam all died, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Through one man's disobedience, sin covered the earth. But through one man's righteousness, righteousness was granted to all of us. Can we pause and give God a praise? Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Truth sets free. Truth sets free. Satan knows the tendency so he uses that against us. He comes and speaks to us that which pertain to works and the law constantly, constantly so that we can never enjoy the peace of God. But it is God's will that we have peace. All right, let me read a little more in Hebrews 10. Follow with me if you go with me there. Verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never, somebody say never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto what? 
perfect, acceptable to God, cleansed. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. There would be no need to keep offering if the sacrifice was able to cleanse, right? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had, listen to this, no more conscience of sin. Well, why do we have conscience of sin? But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. We're to be moved from sin conscious unto, uh, to righteous consciousness. When uh, you think of your life, you say, I'm righteous. You're not righteous because of you, but you're righteous because of the blood. You're righteous because of Jesus Christ. That's how he wants us to think right now. So when I'm accepted in God, it makes me feel different, right? When I'm accepted in God, it makes me act differently, right? My behavior is going to be different because I'm a righteous person, and I know I'm a righteous person, not because of a lot of good things that I do. I will do the good things because I am righteous. Hallelujah, Jesus. But if I feel like I'm, if I'm sin conscious, then I'm going to struggle. Everything is an effort. To do right because of my conscience. That's not clear. But thank God for the blood. It was able to cleanse that inner part of our lives. So now where was that? Verse 3. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It wasn't possible. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come in to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will, look at this again, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ year after year. All right. Once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never, somebody say never, never. take away sins. But this man, somebody say this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for the sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting Till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he had perfected for a year. For two years. Six years. A decade. Forever them that are sanctified. Now we need to pause and give God some praise again. He is worthy of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is not looking on us as guilty people. He's not doing that. He's looking at us as his righteous ones. As his righteous ones. That's how he sees us. The hope is that we will begin to see ourselves. Isn't that right? That's how he sees us. Praise God. All right, now let's see, where am I? 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts 
and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember next year. No more. Take that, you devil. No more. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So we can take that. Now, what is he saying in all of this year? Okay, let's go down to number 22. What are you saying in all this? He's saying, therefore, uh, uh, verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter to the holiness of, by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way, which is he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to see his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. I want you to stand with me. Let's praise the Lord together. He's worthy of praise. This is it. This is it. This is what he gave to me. Praise the Lord. It is that powerful blood. My God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That powerful blood. Hallelujah. The Lamb. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the great judge of the universe of the whole world, when the judge looked upon you and you accepted that blood, that judge took that gavel and hit down there and he said, I declare you not guilty. My God, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. You're not guilty. No matter how we're feeling, we are not guilty. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Does that help anybody? Praise the Lord. I think God is wanting to free us in our minds and in our conscience and our hearts uh, to know that he paid a dear price for us to be free. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We need your help. We need your word, Lord. Your eternal truth that sets our hearts free. That removes, oh God, the guilt and the fears and the feelings, condemnation from our lives. We are justified. Declared as righteous people. Hallelujah. By faith in what he has already done. The master. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The devotional team. If, if you will just kind of give us a worship song. Hallelujah. We trust in that God will remove through the knowledge of truth the guilt and replace it with peace. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for peace. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Now, there is, there is power in the presence of Jesus. That when you feel that presence, it's like he says, son, daughter, you're not guilty. I want you to receive peace and a clear conscience. Oh, bless the Lord. If you feel like you need that today, just kind of make your way up here. We're just going to pray a little. Glory be to God. Thank you, Father. Father, we bless you. 